morning, everyone. Um, my name is Marina Sharp. I'm a professor of international law at Royal Military College Saint-Jean, and I'm chairing this panel this morning on migrants and border controls. Um, just a few reminders. Each presenter will have 10 minutes to present their work, um, and I will be quite strict and give you uh, five, two, and one minute warnings. Um, and once everyone has presented, we'll take uh, questions from the audience. Um, and if I could remind all the speakers to please make sure you speak into the microphone so that the recording can capture uh, what you say. Um, I'll, I'll introduce the pr uh, presenters before they speak rather than uh, at the outset. Um, so our first presenter is Terence Gar uh, Garrett, whose presentation is called Reigning in Migrants, the Spectacle in Del Rio, Texas, and Other Stories of Human Rights Abuses in the Lone Star State. Yeah, so the... The paper I have here, um, the idea came about, I was actually invited uh, to, the, uh, to testify before the Texas House of Representatives uh, Homeland Security and, and Public Safety Committee. And uh, during this time, it was a, co it was a Zoom meeting, <laughs> and uh, there were 14 of us invited. And it's interesting because I was number nine, and the first speaker was Steve McCraw, who was the Texas Department of Public Safety Director. He spent two and a half hours, so I didn't get to uh, present my presentation. So I have a, as an appendix to this paper, and anybody that's interested in this paper, uh, I can send it to you. Um, just to drop me an email. So, so uh, when we look then at the uh, sort of the abstract, I, I wrote a, like I said, a paper, a short one, just for a conference. Cause I, I, I do that normally. I, I looked at the way that uh, Haitians uh, during uh, the summer of, of twenty. 21, uh, moved uh, from mostly from uh, South America, Bolivia, and Brazil primarily, but other places as well, uh, in addition to uh, problems uh, sporadically that happened, like uh, the de destabilization of the Haitian government, that sort of thing, uh, <clears throat> and how they wound up in, of all places, uh, Ciudad Acuna, and crossed over into Del Rio, Texas, and how this was able to be done. And uh, Mr. McCraw, as I uh, mentioned earlier, the DPS director, in his testimony said, well, you know, we didn't have the intel. We didn't know, and neither did the uh, U.S. Border Patrol understand it at all how they wound up there. They, it was a mystery to them. Well, it's not really a mystery when you have WhatsApp and when you have uh, coordination uh, by a group of people who are determined to make their way through, uh, you know, the Darien Gap all the way through to the border, the uh, U.S.-Mexico border. So, uh, and when they arrived there uh, in the summer of 2021, they had uh, uh, gone into Ciudad Acuna and had essentially uh, were buying things. They had, they had money because they had been working in these places. They were essentially kicked out because of COVID-19. And uh, the, so they had resources, and what, what was interesting, one of the uh, uh, legislators pointed out that, um, well, how is it that these, these poor people, these Haitians, how could they possibly afford a cell phone? And how could they possibly have uh, uh, outsmarted uh, U.S. Uh, uh, border protection and, the, uh, and you, uh, Mr. McCraw, and, and what kind of intel? I mean, we, we've got all kinds of weaknesses in terms of securitizing the border, you see. And we spent all this money on Operation Lone Star to sh for what exactly? So they were tr essentially upset uh, because they had spent $3 billion, right, during, for the Operation L Lone Star up to that point, and they essentially had nothing to show for it, particularly when uh, the Haitians were attempting to cross the border. So I've invoked uh, a French situationist philosopher, uh, uh, Guy Debord, and he wrote Society of the Spectacle as sort of a, a, a framework in order to sort of analyze what's taking place uh, for this particular case study as I, I treat it. And uh, so, so, again, they, they, uh, because of Title 42, uh, right, there were restrictions in place, and there still are today, in fact, uh, <clears throat> you had this movement uh, you know, initially, Title 42 was put in by, of course, uh, Trump, but certainly has been kept in place by Biden, whether he 
says he wants it or not, but we saw just the other day that, oh, it was convenient now to be used against the Venezuelans because there are too many of them there crossing the border, you see. So politically, right, uh, it's, it's become damaging to the uh, uh, Biden administration. And part of uh, a previous paper that I wrote, that I just published last month, uh, a paper uh, uh, created a concept called border securocracy. And border securocracy is this idea of uh, giving Border Patrol agents basically sovereign uh, power to make life and death decision or entrance decisions into the U.S. Uh, similar to what happened under uh, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And so uh, that paper basically I developed a framework and I use of course even Todd Miller's work as well in terms of empire borders uh, to essentially uh, create this concept and the the sort of uh, neoliberal globalization aspects of it in terms of the spread from the global no north over the global south. So let's get to uh, DeBoer. I make the case for him uh, in this. I'm sorry, I only have 10 minutes. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, the, the narrative study approach, I use David Boji out of New Mexico State University. Uh, basically, the case study approach laid out uh, in the framework. So again, as I mentioned, WhatsApp, up to 15,000 re refugees. And they were going back and forth uh, at the behest of the Border Patrol between Ciudad Acuna and Del Rio, Texas, because the, the town of uh, Del Rio, Texas is too small and couldn't accommodate them, but all, and Ciudad Acuna had. So they de developed a colored card system so, to sort of sort them out and meter them in, but not unlike what happened under previous uh, conditions under migrant protection protocols and, uh, uh, and other programs by the Trump administration also pushed forward even into uh, the Biden administration up until recently. And of course all the problems I uh, depicted earlier became more uh, slanted. But in this particular uh, work <clears throat> I look at the, the actual stories uh, being told by the uh, uh, migrants, uh, by the Haitians, and uh, just a couple of things, uh, Mr. Hongvier, uh, we have been through 11 different countries to get here. I had to keep going, my father has no, no one now and the only person who can send him money is my brother in the US and I need to help too. And so, uh, so the, the, under dire circumstances, right, they, they, they decided to, to make the trek, the treacherous trek uh, from uh, South America all the way into, uh, to, of all places, to see it out at Cunha. So, um, again, the ticket system, as I mentioned, I, I, I say it's a commodification effort. It exemplifies a spectacle of a safe haven, ostensibly for the escape to the U.S. Uh, Haitian migrants. It had to make snap decisions based on whether it was worth entering, leading to, to border crossers, not only being completely aware of all options and whether they were dealt with fairly. See, there was this issue of what did the color card system actually mean, and there was some value actually placed on certain colors because it meant that you could go forward uh, if you had the card. So they, they started trading them. They started trading and deciding whether or not it was going to be worth it taking the risk to enter the United States. And then uh, here's another uh, vignette here. It's a very difficult process for all of us. Uh, I had faith and I made it to the US, you have to try. So you had different uh, points and variation uh, in terms of even the migrants having to trade. And you can see a picture here uh, of the colored uh, ticket system employed by CBP agents. And, uh, and across, and at that point, uh, it was, it was uh, uh, the, le the level of, of the Rio Grande was uh, such that they could cross easily uh, back and forth, but uh, we know from this year it wasn't the same level during the same time period and, and uh, more than 18 people, I, I think 18 people lost their lives trying to, trying to cross from Del, uh, Ciudad Acuna to Del Rio. Uh, okay, so there you go. Um, here, this is data. Uh, I got to, oh, pictures. So you can see here uh, where I get the title. Now there's been an Office of Inspector General report exonerating the Border Patrol agents for doing this, by the way. They said there's no evidence of anyone being struck by rains, but I think the picture tells another story. That's why I included it. Okay, uh, I'm almost done, I think. Uh, okay, so I, I talk about Mallorcas and 
the trying to re re represent what DHS is doing in, in this sort of debacle. And uh, you can see kind of a map here of the area I have for you to put it in some kind of context. I'm running out of time. <laughs> oh, sorry. You can't see the map. There it is. Okay. And then, uh, and then of course, Governor uh, Operation Lone Star in Texas uh, is also part of the paper. And Texas set up uh, what was called a wall of steel, if I can see that, uh, it, it, in order to keep the Haitians from escaping. <laughs> Okay, and of course the Haitians didn't want to escape, right? They wanted to be uh, processed by Border Patrol, but it's part of what I call the spectacle uh, of, of this. Uh, okay, I've got, to, I've got to end it here. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, okay, so I, I point out, out that the real spectacle here is a steel wall spectacle. It made for a good political uh, theater a spectacle as part of the $3 billion spent, so I, I, I attempt to end it. And then I end it with, is that, yeah, there we go. Uh, the combined spectacles of the reigning of the Haitians in Del Rio by CBP and the steel wall of Operation Lone Star are indicative of the overall border spectacle that symbolizes commodification of the security apparatus designed to profit from human misery. And politicians and other profit seekers will continue with the border spectacle. The false supersedes the true, this is from the board, and men will continue to objectify and subject, subjugate the destitute, the victims of calamity, i.e. migrants, asylees, uh, refugees, and other border crossers to make capital and accumulate uh, political power. And I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you. So next up we have Luna Vives talking about the transformation of maritime search and rescue systems in migration contexts. I'm going to start. Thank you, everybody. Um, so what I'm going to present today is a, thank you, is a, yes, is a new project that I'm working on uh, with, in collaboration with Arnaud Banos, who is a research director at the CNRS in France and also a member of the Société Nationale de Sauvetage en Mer. This project is our first attempt of, uh, at developing a pan-European approach uh, to maritime rescue in context of migration. And what, what we want to do is we want to understand on the one hand the convergence of ways of doing maritime SAR in Europe over the last two decades and on the other hand, the role that these systems play in the broader uh, European anti-immigration border regime. In my presentation, I'm going to start with an introduction uh, to maritime search and rescue, and then I'm going to argue that since 2005, this life-saving tool has been gradually integrated into the European uh, border apparatus to assist in the control of unwanted migration um, although arguably this process is uh, at different stages in different sections of the border. And I will finish the presentation with five observations uh, and some concluding thoughts. So what is maritime SAR, search and rescue? Protecting human life at sea is an unambiguous legal obligation for all EU member states. This obligation is well established in international uh, maritime customary law, international conventions, and domestic and European laws and, and regulations. There is really no gray zone here. Every country that has signed the SAR Convention, which is to say every EU member state, has the obligation to define its search and re uh, rescue region, which is different and usually larger than its territorial waters, to establish a search and rescue uh, system that has the necessary resources, and to negotiate the terms of collaboration with neighboring countries which may have different ways of doing things or different capacities. This way, search and rescue systems are a bit like fire departments that need to be prepared to work across jurisdictions. And I want to insist that at no, no point was search and rescue imagined or designed to be part of border control or migration control. The good function of the system depends on the clear definition of the geographical boundaries of the search and rescue regions, the SRRs. And in this map, in the circles, you can see the SRRs that we have been comparing and working with. Because each country has developed their own search and rescue system since uh, more or less 18, 1985, the institutional, institutional arrangements are different for each case. So for example, in Italy and Greece, 
Um, the National Coast Guards are primarily responsible for coordinating and carrying out um, rescue operations. And in the central, central Mediterranean, these are almost uh, completely militarized, with the exception of uh, NGOs that intervene, sometimes against the wishes of the government, uh, NGOs such as SOS Mediterranean, Proactive and Open, Open Arms, CI, CI Watch, etc. And what they do is they intervene to compensate for what is actually um, an abandonment of rescue operations on the part of the states. Maritime uh, rescue in Spain is the responsibility of a government-run agency that had absolutely no links to the military until 2008. And since then, since that year, uh, the Guardia Civil, which is part of the Ministry of Defense, has taken over the coordination of only those operations uh, where migrant boats are involved. These are region routes that have uh, seen thousands of migrants um, per year over the last two decades. But what we want to know is where does France fit in all this? What we see in the English Channel is, a, in, is the situation is evolving very rapidly since 2018 with an exponential number of crossings. And we're talking about more than 35,000 so far this year compared to 8,400 in 20, 2020. So we're talking about more than a fourfold increase uh, in less than two years. In the French uh, SRR, we see rescues that are less integrated with ways of working that are more idiosyncratic, if you want. Uh, and here, the emergency responses are coordinated by the MRTC uh, Grigny and other organizations such as, for example, the French Navy, the Joanne, High Sea Tugs, uh, the Société Nationale de Sauvetage en Mer, contributed to it on a daily basis. But we see signs of convergence. So here, if you focus on the second to last column, which shows the implication of the French uh, Marine, the, the French Navy, uh, you see that between 2021, which is the blue dot, and 2022, the participation um, in these operations has gone from 20%, around 20%, to almost 30% in less than a year. We also see other signs of convergence. Here you see a picture that could have taken, it could have been taken in the Mediterranean, was, was taken in the French uh, side of the English Channel. And you see also, we also observe that the French Navy has changed the, the way they show themselves and the way they work. Regardless uh, of specific arrangements, non-discrimination is in the spirit and in the letter of the multiple conventions and laws currently in effect. However, as migration, and particularly sea migration, has been politicized, circuitized, and then criminalized, rescue systems and services have been gradually um, integrated into each, into each countries and by extension to the European Union's anti-immigration border architecture. As I said, this integration is not homogeneous, and I can go into more detail um, if you wish later. Um, but however, if, even if incomplete and fragmented, there is evidence of uh, both co-optation of these services into the migration uh, system and of regional integration. And these have very important implications, notably to, for the um, international security, um, international protection system in the European Union. There is a timeline to this process, and uh, we have divided these timeline in three main periods. Thank you. The first period is before 2005 when migration and rescues are seen as completely different independent areas of intervention and policy and rescues, maritime rescues, was, were an area exclusively of national concern. Then there is a transitional period between 2005 and 2015. There we have the creation of Frontex, uh, with the first maritime operations. We also have the Lampedusa shipwreck in October 2013. Uh, we have the growth of, uh, the, the very rapid growth in the budget and mandate uh, of Frontex. And then since 2015, of course, um, the date line, the date there has to do with the event uh, in the Greek-Turkish border in 2015 and 2016. There has been a deep, um, transformation of, of these national SAR systems to integrate them both into immigration control and to, uh, into a way 
a European way of doing maritime rescues. And here we have to signal the 2019 Frontex regulation, whose ultimate goal is the creation of a European integrated border management system. What have we observed? We have observed two things in, ter in terms of the general context. The first, the first thing is the, um, is the fact that mass rescues have become the norm throughout these five regions we have looked at. And this is important because operations involving large groups of people, and we're talking up to 430 people at a time, demand specific procedures and equipment. In other words, uh, even those involving more than 25 people um, force national rescue systems to change their modus operandi. The second thing that we have observed in the context is a convergence. Um, it's a transition to a model of migration governments, governance with a heavy reliance on humanitarian discourses. Not insurgent humanitarianism, but the kind of humanitarian border logics that, we, uh, that have been uh, looked at in Europe. So in this context, we're particularly interested um, in three in three trends, I'm going to go straight to my conclusions because I'm going to talk about them here too. Um, and based on these trends, our first argument, our first conclusion is that we need to move away from the territorial trap and develop a, a regional approach to better understand the evolution of maritime search and rescue systems in Europe. The second conclusion um, is that from this regional focus and with the understanding that national variations will necessarily remain even if there are, thank you, uh, if there's a more European way of doing uh, maritime rescues, is that we need to, that, that it has become imperative to study how the co-optation of maritime search and rescue for migration control purposes, the normalization of systematic human rights violations in this context, and the transition from a model of government to a model of governance articulate and reinforce each other. Now, this is our first, our very first attempt at bringing these different contexts, different systems in conversation with each other. So we welcome your thoughts, your comments and suggestions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Michael Kuhn, uh, speaking uh, about danger and death, a study of the impact of the Secure Fences Act and the Southwest U.S. border. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today presenting this work uh, with my colleagues, uh, <coughs> Cynthia Vansack from the uh, St. Lawrence University and Abigail Blanco and Susan Derringer, both from the University of Tampa with me. Um, to give you an idea of what we're looking at, um, I probably don't need to tell very many people in this room that there's a growing number of politicians and, and U.S. citizens who have been calling for the federal government to completely seal off the southern U.S. border with Mexico. Um, the previous spoker speaker talked about uh, Operation Lone Star or Governor Abbott. I believe the bill is now up to about $4 billion of putting shipping containers and lining up police cars and things along the border. Um, during the 2016 presidential campaign, Donald Trump wanted roughly $20 billion to build more wall. Uh, state government in Arizona is spending hundreds of millions of dollars uh, trying to uh, enforce border controls. And that's all on top of the four plus billion dollars that the US Border Patrol gets every year. Um, and so as an economist, um, I look at those figures and I think that's a lot of money. Um, and what are we getting in exchange for that money? Right, um, and so uh, within my own field, not too many people have really looked at uh, what we're getting in exchange for that. Um, so we thought that it would be very instructive to look back and see what we actually accomplished by building the wall that already exists. Um, so the majority of the fencing along the U.S. southern border was built after the passing of the 2006 Secure Fences Act. Um, I was going to make a comment here about how generally any changes in immigration reform is often tied to increases in border enforcement. We've seen that since the 1990s. Um, but if you follow the American news, last week uh, GOP House leader Mark Meadows said that he's not going to give anything in exchange for border security. He just wants more security and that's it. So there's that. Um, but the 2006 Secure Fences Act, in addition to uh, asking for 613 miles of uh, fencing along the U.S. border, 
Um, it also allowed for more of a, a, a virtual border that some people spoke about yesterday, um, using new technology like cameras and drones and things like that. Also increased the number of Border Patrol agents. Um, so looking at just the fence itself, um, prior to 2006, there was roughly 72 miles worth of fencing along the southern border. Most of that was in San Diego area. Um, afterwards, uh, that went up to about 615 miles of border, about half and half uh, vehicle barrier and pedestrian barrier. So you can see in the chart there. Um, and then after 2009, basically all the new construction stopped. Uh, so one of the things that we want to think about then is, well, what did all that fencing accomplish, right? Um, probably the primary goal of that new fencing is to stop people from crossing the border. So we want to see, well, did it prevent people from crossing the border? Um, the proxy that we can use for that is the number of apprehensions along the border, which gives us an idea of, oh, there was supposed to be a really nice graph there showing you that uh, the number of apprehensions significantly dropped. I have it here if anybody wants to see it later. <laughs> um, it, it in fact did drop quite substantially after 2006. Um, now, how much of that is due to the fencing itself is debatable because that also coincides with the 2008 Great Recession. Um, and during that time, not only were few, fewer people coming across, there was a lot of migrants that were actually returning back to Mexico over that time because the jobs just simply weren't there. Um, if you could see that graph, you would also see a similar dip around the 2001 recession. Um, and if you fast forward to today, the number of apprehensions is actually back up to where it was prior to 2001 and the fence is still there and the people are still coming, right? So um, how much of that how much of the fence actually prevented people from coming across uh, is somewhat debatable. Um, but then some kind of secondary goals, um, you know, would be why you'd ask, well, why would we want to stop people from coming over, right? Um, the two primary goals uh, are generally public safety uh, and the economy, usually measured by jobs and wages and things like that. So one study that looked at the effect of uh, the 2006 Secure Fence Act on crime uh, by uh, Admin and FOB published this year in the Eastern Economic Journal, um, looked at crime rates in and around places where fences were built. They found it had absolutely zero effect on property or violent crimes, right? So if you're, our goal was to reduce crime by putting in this fence, it didn't work. Um, another study looking at the effect on employment and wages <coughs> uh, by uh, Alan Dobbin and Morton um, found uh, that the Secure Fence Act in the communities around where the fence was built uh, increased wages of low education workers by $2.89 per year and decreased wages of high education workers by $3.60 per year. Per year, not per hour, right? Um, so not a very big effect uh, at all either, right? So basically, you know, we got nothing economically uh, in return for this investment in the wall. But what did we get? What did the wall actually accomplish or the fencing actually accomplish, right? So Alan Dobbin and Martin, again in their paper, uh, outlined three major effects that could occur from putting in the fences, what they call the deterrent effect, the diversion effect, and the detour effect, right? So the deterrent effect is preventing people from attempting to cross the border in the first place. Um, they found very little evidence. They estimated that it reduced by about 40,000 people per year, so maybe 20 to 25% of the attempts. Um, but again, if you fast forward today, that's all gone. Um, then they also looked at uh, the diversion effect, which basically says if you build a fence in one area, it might change where they decide to go within the United States, right? So if I was planning to go to Los Angeles, but you wall off that area, I might decide to go to Dallas instead, right? Um, and then they, they, so the detour effect, where I might still choose to go to the same city, but I'm gonna take a different route, right? Um, and so they found significant evidence for those last two effects, right? And so, my colleague, uh, Cynthia Banzak, is a big fan of alliteration, and so in our study we wanted to add two more D effects that could potentially occur, uh, the danger effect and the death effect, right? So it turns out when they built uh, the fencing for the Secure, Community, or Secure Fences Act, um, there was very little instruction about where to build the fence. There was a few key areas around certain ports of entries where they told them to extend it 10 miles in either direction, but the remaining part of the fence they could just build wherever they want. Uh, and it turned out they built it where it was easy to build, right? So where it was close to roads, where the soil and ground was easy to build on top of, so like not near the river because the soil's too sandy, um, where they didn't have any very many environmental hurdles to get over. And so it was kind of random. Um, but it turns out places where it's easy to build a fence, it's probably easy to cross the border uh, as well, right? And so if you're blocking off those areas, then if you wanted to decide to cross the border, you had to take a different route, uh, which is potentially more dangerous. You have to go through desert, um, you have to go through mountains, you have to cross rivers, right? You have to go a long way away from civilization and you might dehydrate along the way, et cetera. 
So there's some previous research that has found uh, that has led to death uh, with part of what people call the, the gatekeeper complex, um, where they increased border enforcement in the 1990s in the urban areas, and so people started crossing in the desert. Um, and so we wanted to extend that research to, to look at the effect of the Secure Fences Act. This red line is the graph that was supposed to be on the one that wasn't there. Um, so that's the number of apprehensions uh, per year. Uh, the blue bars are the number of migrant deaths uh, reported by the Department of Homeland Security every year. So if you look at uh, 2005 and 2006, um, the number of people, people dying uh, actually is increasing for about seven or eight years there. Um, while the number of people being apprehended, and again, is a, that's kind of a proxy for the number of people who are trying to cross, uh, was declining. So what that means in practice then is if you calculate the death rate, and we calculate it as the number of deaths per 100,000 apprehensions, um, during that period, um, the number of deaths per 100,000 apprehensions more than doubled, right? Um, and so we wanted to look at um, how that was affected in areas where fence was built and areas where fence was not built. Um, and so uh, we got data on uh, the number of deaths, number of apprehensions, um, the number of Border Patrol agents operating in Border Patrol sectors um, from the Department of Homeland Security. And then we got uh, data on the construction of the wall um, from uh, Castaneda and Guerrero um, relating to something some, one of the speakers said yesterday. This, these are actually journalists. This is a news article. Uh, they made a really cool map, and we asked them if we can get the data from the map. Um, so researchers and journalists, we need each other. Right? Um, they really, really help us out on that. Um, but that data actually had the location, the type of barrier, the length, the timing, and all of that. So we leveraged that. Um, so, we, so we basically mapped that out uh, on Border Patrol sectors. So there's nine Border Patrol sectors along the southern U.S. border um, of various lengths. Um, this was a really cool graph. Um, okay, so that, at least one of them showed up there. Um, so if you look at here, the blue line is the uh, ratio of border fencing to the length of the border. Um, and so if you see San Diego, prior to the Secure Fence Act, about 50% uh, was walled off in one way or another. After, almost all of it completely walled off. Um, you know, Yuma, Tucson, and El Paso had almost none. Um, and then increased to 50%, 60-70%. So what we did is we uh, estimated uh, first uh, whether uh, fences uh, mattered. Um, so we estimated whether fences matter, and my table didn't show up here either. Oh, sorry. Um, and so basically we found in areas where uh, fencing was built, uh, the death rate doubled. Um, in areas where fences was not built, the death rate tripled. Um, and then we wanted to look at where whether the type of fencing matters. And so we looked at um, the type of fencing being vehicle barriers or pedestrian barriers. Um, and so uh, for every 10% increase in vehicle barrier, uh, the death rate increased by 6.2 6 people per 100,000. Um, and then interestingly, the pedestrian barrier, uh, for every 10% increase, the death rate actually decreased by 3.7%. Um, we suspect uh, that the pedestrian barrier is actually because if you seal off the pedestrian routes, it increases the likelihood that you're apprehended, and so you're actually increasing the denominator instead of, the num instead of increasing the numerator. Um, and then going forward, we want to look at, does the location of the fencing matter? So we're building out some geographical stuff, um, looking at building a danger index, seeing what's the terrain like that you have to cross, how far are you from roads, how far are you from cities, et cetera, and I'm out of time, so thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, our last speaker is Talia uh, darignan gignier who's going to speak about uh, l'immigration non documentée aux États-Unis, une carrefour discriminatoire pour les migrants d'origine autochtone du triangle nord d'Amérique centrale. Thank you. Um, I am very happy to be here today because it's the first time that I will be presenting my master thesis. I will be presenting in French. However, I have prepared a PowerPoint in English, and I will be pleased to take any question in English as well at the end. Alors, mon mémoire de maîtrise s'intitule « L'immigration non documentée aux États-Unis, un carrefour discriminatoire pour les migrants et les migrantes d'origine autochtone du triangle nord d'Amérique centrale ». Et pour comprendre le contexte du sujet, en fait, je vais vous ramener en 2019, lors d'un terrain de recherche que j'ai réalisé euh, en Arizona, à Tucson. Et c'est vraiment là où j'ai été confrontée à un événement qui m'a euh, menée vers ce sujet-là. Donc, une fois à Tucson, j'ai assisté à euh, un tribunal, à enfin une audience d'immigration qui était dans le, dans le contexte de l'opération Streamline, que vous connaissez probablement. 
où est-ce que jusqu'à 70 migrants euh, non documentés vont être jugés ensemble, en masse. Et donc, quand j'assistais à cette audience-là, euh, l'audience avait lieu en anglais, avec une traduction simultanée en espagnol. Par contre, c'était très clair que pendant cette audience-là, les migrants qui étaient sur place, c'était surtout des jeunes hommes, ne comprenaient pas nécessairement ce qui était en train de se passer, ne comprenaient pas nécessairement euh, les charges qui étaient portées contre eux, parce qu'ils ne parlaient ni anglais, ni espagnol, mais plutôt mam, kitsché, bref, des langues autochtones, surtout maya du Guatemala. Donc, à ce moment-là, en fait, c'est toute ma compréhension, mon idée de, de l'immigration, en fait, qui a été bouleversée, parce que euh, j'avais devant moi des gens dont l'identité, dont l'existence même était très peu abordée dans le corpus littéraire sur l'immigration. Et donc, j'ai tenté à ma façon, avec ma posture de chercheur canadienne à l'automne, de percer euh, ce champ d'études-là en abordant, en fait, de manière croisée les études autochtones et les études de migration, pour pouvoir, en fait, euh, visibiliser leur vécu migratoire. Donc, euh, avant d'aller un peu plus dans ces théories euh, migratoires mixtes, si je peux dire, mais en fait, j'aimerais ça vous, vous dresser le portrait de qui sont ces migrants autochtones d'origine, ces migrants d'origine autochtone. Donc, c'est important de savoir, c'est que l'immigration non documentée aux États-Unis a beaucoup changé lors des dix dernières années. Et on a vu de plus en plus de migrants venir de la région du Triangle Nord d'Amérique centrale, composée des euh, pays du Honduras, du Salvador et du Guatemala. Et pour vous donner une idée plus précise, entre 2010 et aujourd'hui, eh bien, la proportion de migrants en provenance de ces trois pays elle est passée d'environ 10 de l'ensemble des flux migratoires enregistrés à la frontière sud des États-Unis à près de 50 Et ce qui est intéressant par rapport à cette région, et la raison pour laquelle je pense qu'elle se distingue peut-être d'autres, c'est qu'il y a une forte présence autochtone dans ces trois pays. Et comment est-ce que ça se traduit euh, sur le terrain? Eh bien, un sondage qui a été réalisé par l'Inter-American Development Bank auprès de 1859 personnes qui ont migré aux États-Unis entre 2007 et 2017, a révélé qu'au moins 15 d'entre elles s'identifiaient comme autochtones. Et quand on s'intéressait aux données spécifiques aux migrants du Guatemala, eh bien, ça montait à 33 d'entre eux. Donc, en fait, les données parlent d'elles-mêmes. L'immigration autochtone, ce n'est pas un concept qui appartient au passé. Au contraire, les autochtones ont euh, migré depuis toujours et vont continuer à le faire. Et je pense que c'est important que notre champ d'études sur les frontières, sur euh, l'immigration, sur les murs, s'intéresse à leur vécu migratoire pour qu'on puisse justement visibiliser leur réalité. Et donc, je pense qu'une première étape euh, pour visibiliser justement ces réalités-là, c'est de poser un regard dit décolonial sur l'immigration. Puis on en a parlé un petit peu tout à l'heure lors du keynote de repenser les frontières, de repenser le territoire, parce que euh, la frontière, c'est un concept qui est colonial, ça a été imposé sur des territoires qui étaient déjà occupés en y attachant une identité nationale. Par contre, le problème, c'est qu'en ayant une vision très nationale de l'immigration, en parlant de l'immigration par pays d'origine, par identité nationale, eh bien, on vient justement invisibiliser des communautés qui ne s'identifient pas nécessairement par rapport à ce pays d'origine. Par exemple, on va parler d'immigration en parlant d'une personne qui va migrer d'un pays A vers un pays B. On va parler d'un Mexicain qui va migrer vers les États-Unis. On oublie souvent de parler des autres identités, des cultures, bref, de parler de la réalité de ces personnes. Et l'autre problème également, c'est qu'aux États-Unis et au Canada également, on a une vision très territoriale de l'Autochtone, dans le sens où on va souvent parler euh, d'une personne autochtone en raison de son degré de densité, d'un point de vue du système. Et donc, on va constamment rattacher cette identité à une appartenance territoriale. Par contre, en migrant, en traversant de multiples frontières coloniales, c'est comme si du point de vue des États-Unis, j'inclus également le Canada là-dedans, c'est qu'on va euh, en quelque sorte tenter de couper cette identité et euh, du côté des États-Unis, dans le cas de l'étude que j'ai faite, il n'y a comme aucun outil, aucune euh, reconnaissance nécessairement de cette identité autochtone qui provient d'un autre territoire. Et là, je n'ai pas le temps d'entrer dans euh, toutes les conséquences qui découlent de ce système où est-ce qu'on visibilise très peu les populations autochtones en contexte de migration. Mais je tenais à vous parler surtout de la barrière de la langue parce qu'on sait que la langue, la communication, c'est crucial quand on parle euh, de contact entre les personnes migrantes et les agences fédérales. 
Par contre, les ressources qui ont été développées dans les dernières années, surtout pour euh, les migrants <coughs> autochtones, en fait, sont très et insuffisantes et même inadaptées, dans le sens où, euh, par exemple, en 2014, le département de la sécurité intérieure a développé un outil qui s'appelle « I speak »,« Je parle » dans plus de 70 langues. Par contre, le problème, c'est que cet outil-là, qui doit être utilisé par les personnes migrantes pour pouvoir identifier, par exemple, la langue dont ils parlent, dont, dont ils parlent en fait, euh, ne prend pas en compte que ce n'est pas nécessairement toutes les personnes qui sont en mesure de lire ou de reconnaître leur langue écrite. Ce qui fait en sorte qu'il y a d'ailleurs une étude euh, qui a été menée par le Migration Policy Center qui a constaté que 40 des personnes migrantes aux États-Unis ne possèdent pas les connaissances ou les compétences de base en matière d'alphabétisation et que le taux, selon leurs études, était d'ailleurs plus élevé pour les populations autochtones en misant sur le fait que la transmission linguistique passait souvent par une tradition orale. Un autre enjeu auquel euh, les locuteurs autochtones dans le système d'immigration font face, en fait, c'est toute la question de trouver des interprètes qui sont compétents dans leur langue. Et je tenais à vous donner un exemple rapporté par Rachel Nolan dans un article publié en 2019. Et elle raconte l'histoire d'une mère maya dont la demande d'asile a été rejetée sur la base d'une mauvaise interprétation linguistique. Et elle écrit, et je vais le traduire, « Une mère détenue dans ce centre a déclaré à des interprètes non guatémaltèques qu'elle avait eu des problèmes au Guatemala en raison de ses blues. » ce qui semble anodin traduit en anglais. Or, ce qu'elle disait, c'est qu'elle avait des problèmes à cause de son « huipil », une blouse tissée à la main portée par les mayas. Elle disait qu'elle était persécutée parce qu'elle était autochtone, mais l'interprète n'a pas compris ou bien expliqué. La demande de la femme a été rejetée, puis elle a été déportée. Et ça, c'est juste un exemple, une répercussion parmi tant d'autres. Et j'aurais pu vous parler également de perte identitaire, de discrimination ou encore de négligence en matière de soins de santé. Mais j'aimerais prendre les dernières minutes qui me restent pour vous parler de recommandations, en fait, qui ont été formulées par l'Alianza Indigena Sin Fronteras et l'International Maya League pour faire face justement à cette situation. Donc, la première, c'est de créer un groupe consultatif sur les langues autochtones et les cultures pour être en mesure de déployer des ressources qui sont davantage adaptées. La deuxième, c'est d'élaborer un programme d'éducation sur les droits autochtones pour le personnel qui travaille dans la gestion de l'immigration. La troisième, c'est d'ouvrir une enquête sur les décès non élucidés à la frontière et dans les installations gouvernementales. Et la quatrième, c'est que les États-Unis s'engagent à lancer une invitation formelle aux rapporteurs spéciaux des Nations unies pour effectuer une enquête sur les abus et les décès à la frontière. Et donc, pour conclure rapidement, euh, je tenais en fait simplement à vous inviter à poursuivre des recherches en ce sens afin d'avoir des analyses qui sont encore plus pointues et même à l'échelle même de ces communautés. Et je tenais aussi à dire que dans cette présentation, j'ai surtout misé sur la barrière de la langue, mais qui, encore une fois, c'est une répercussion parmi tant d'autres, et qu'en fait, c'est important de pousser plus loin la recherche, puis d'étudier différents axes d'oppression, notamment liés euh, aux violences de genre ou de sexe encore. Et donc, j'espère que cette présentation va vous avoir euh, invité ou sensibilisé à étudier ce genre euh, d'axes d'oppression. Voilà. Merci. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have about um, 20 minutes for questions. So if you have a question, I would invite you to please come to the mic at the front. I have a question. Please. Okay, uh, Dr. Kuhn, thank you for your presentation. Uh, there are a couple of things I want to uh, point out. Um, your model, the deterrence division deter effects, right? You looked at well, those. So that, that uh, was somebody else's model, so we added to that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, how about the attraction effect? It, it, yeah, that's missing because what happens in Texas, once the, the, the coyote will cross the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, right, and they'll park the migrants right there to be picked up or apprehended or uh, encountered, and that's, that's the part two of my question. Uh, it was uh, some colleagues at, at the University of California at San Diego looked at the data that was being presented by the Customs and Border Protection. They found a, they, they saw the bump that you're talking about, but what happened was they were comparing, they were saying apples and oranges are essentially the same thing. So Title 42 restrictions are encounters. Right. Yeah, and, and encounters, they, they showed up 
from the period from November through February into the uh, Biden administration, encounters were skyrocketed at the numbers. And so, an account, and they found out that 44% of the people they encountered were returnees multiple, multiple times. And, uh, and then even the Border Patrol later had to change the categories. So uh, you probably need to account for that um, in terms of the overall numbers. And there, uh, well, one other point, uh, there was also, be, because of uh, COVID-19 and, uh, and the lockdown of the border and migrant protection protocols before that, they, they, people were backed up. I mean, I remember going to Matamoros and seeing about 5,000 people camped out and you know, some, in some instances for two to three years trying to be metered into the United States. So there was a backlog, uh, a, a crush that came across and I was wondering if your paper or the, what you're planning to do with this was gonna explain those things, thank you. Right, well so yeah, I guess short answer is our, our time frame for this study predates that. Okay. Um, so yeah, so when but this would be before they made the switch to reporting encounters versus apprehensions, um, for sure. Um, I, I will add, uh, for the coyote part of it, we, um, we attempted to, to do a similar study to see how it affected the use and, and price of coyotes, um, but the only really good data for that that we know of um, is the Mexican Migration Project data set, and um, in the time period that we wanted to look at, the sample size is too small to break it up along the Border Patrol sectors by year, and so we weren't able to get a good enough measure of, of prices, enough observations to actually do a sound study on that. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we have some questions from the audience now. Uh, we'll take them one at a time. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, I also had a question for Dr. Kuhn, and I'm gonna ask an economist about randomization. Uh, but one of the things that you had said that stood out to me was that after they got the funding, by and large, beyond the points of expansion, the decision of where to wall was almost random. And that struck me as interesting, and I don't have any background in the real granular decision making for that, so I'd like to hear a little bit more, because to me, my prior would have been exactly what happened, that they would build near potential migration corridors, places that are easy to wall, right? But it's also not as innocuous as that. Leaving hostile terrain open as part of a deliberate strategy, I, I think is you know something we've heard quite a bit about before. So essentially, I just wanted to hear a little bit more on that decision-making process because I, I find it interesting and it, it ran against my priors a little bit. Right, so yeah, so this, um mostly came from a, another paper that I can direct you to um, that's in the American Academy of General Policy um, that came out in 2020. But, but basically, so there was a, there's some certain criteria that have to be met in order to be able to actually build the wall, right? So you have to have the property rights to build on the wall. So a lot of it occurred on federal land. Um, there was some um, discussion in the Secure Fence Act about the, the steepness or the grade of the terrain. So in the areas where they said you gotta build 10, feet, 10 miles out or 15 miles out, it's like, but not if it's more than a 30 degree angle or something like that. Um, and so then, and then there was also, you know, issues of like, so there was literally like no fence built in like the Laredo sector or the Rio Grande Valley because the soil near the river um, is so unstable that if you're gonna try to build a fence, you gotta go, you know, a couple miles out, and then what's the point of having the fence a couple miles out, right? Um, and so, so those were some of the decisions. There was environmental concerns and private property rights and, and, and things like that. That, but I agree with you that I mean that's one of the points is that you know where it's easy to build, it's probably also easy to cross. Um, and so that's kind of where it it was somewhat random, but but not, um, and 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 somewhat you know, unstrategic, right? And, and so, you know, your point about strategically kind of pushing them into hostile terrain, um, that's been something that's been going on since the 1990s. I mean, that was the whole point of Operation Gatekeeper and, 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 and the others um, was to, you know, prevent people from coming into the urban areas and, and, and making them cross in the desert. And if you actually look at the death data and the cause of death data um, before and after that period, you know, prior to 1994, you know, 92, most of the migrant deaths were like, vehicle accidents because they were crossing in San Diego and running through the highway and, and getting hit by cars. And then after that, it's all exposure and dehydration and, and, and other things, so, yeah. Super interesting, thanks so much. Thanks. So, at the risk of being annoying, I also have a question for Michael, <laughs> sorry. Um, I guess I left so many mysteries in my presentation that people want to know more. Uh, well, also, it's just the problem of queuing, right? Like, you kind of get stuck in the queue where you get stuck in the queue. So if you follow a question, it's not your choice. But 
Uh, my question was this. So we know it's really hard to tell the effect of any kind of walling system in part because of the coincidence with uh, economic declines, specifically in 08 and the crash, loss of job market and so forth. But what struck me as complicated about your story wasn't just that we can't tell what degree uh, walling is playing a role in that dip in apprehensions, but also in the 06 period, it wasn't just walls that were being created, it was a whole host of kinds of things. And some of them looked like walls, they were apprehension types, right? They were things like extra border guards. Uh, but there were also all these other kinds of instruments that involved trying to make it harder for people to get jobs, for example, in the US that came out of 2006. And so technological advances and economic ones all merged. So I wouldn't know how you'd possibly be able to disentangle those, but I would like you to speak about it because in the, in the talk, it made it seem like the only real confounder was the lack of jobs, and I don't think that's, that's right. No, I, yeah, absolutely not. Um, so to your point about the other, the other factors, I mean, I guess I mentioned kind of briefly in one second that you know, in addition to building the fence, another part of the Secret Fence Act was um, other technologies, so surveillance technologies and towers and drones and, and beefed up security. Um, we controlled for what we could um, with the data that we had available. So really one of the main other controls that we had in there was um, the number of border patrol agents working in each sector, um, which that would also reduce the number of, uh, potentially reduce the number of, of people we had apprehended. Um, other types of, of data uh, in terms of enforcement um, are, are largely unavailable. Um, Homeland Security is notorious for not complying with, with FOIA requests or not divulging any kind of data. Um, one of the other things that we, we wanted to control for but couldn't, right, um, is that apprehensions isn't really kind of the best measure, right? It's kind of noisy and, and it, what we'd really want is the number of attempted crossings. Um, and so we looked at um, data on the apprehension rate, right, which gives us a better number of, of crossing attempts at least, um, but Homeland Security only reports that at the aggregate level. Um, which makes sense because I wouldn't want to let everybody know what's the easiest sector to get through, right? Um, and so, so we try to control for, for uh, as best we could for what we could. Um, largely, at least in the economic literature, um, the other part that you mentioned about uh, making it more difficult to get jobs, so programs like E-Verify and, and things like that, most of the economic literature finds that that has been largely ineffective and done little to nothing. Um, there's very little enforcement on um, on the employer side of you know part of part of the you know the 1986 ERCA was to to put in that penalties for employers who hire undocumented immigrants um, that largely goes unused um, uh, except for in cases where they're trying to do some political theater and they go and you know raid a meatpacking plant or something like that but e-verify is super easy to get around and and, and lots of people do it um, and so a lot of states haven't even adopted it or don't even use it because it's just so easy to beat. So I hope that answers your question a little bit, um, but yeah. Uh, hi, I have a couple of questions for the last presentation. Uh, well, uh, one is about if there is a relation or there has been relation or encounters between uh, indigenous people that has been before the settlement foundation of Arizona and indigenous people that came from the south of, of the continent. I don't know if there has been relation encounters. And the other question is, if there has been a change or policies to push the, the that can be translated indigenous in, in indigenous language in counties or in specific places in Arizona, because I remember, like for example, in California, in Los Angeles, there has been a really great initiative for indigenous people. So I don't know if in the local uh, cities in Arizona has been uh, initiatives. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, so in terms of conflicts, um, is that something that I've been searching a lot, like within um, immigration groups? But what I saw is that in some, some publications is that there are conflicts in terms of like how indigenous people coming from um, South America or Latin America um, within the Latin American community in the sense of there are still some stereotypes or prejudice that have been, um, been said inside of the community in the US, and sometimes they feel like they don't necessarily, um, they can't really live their identity as indigenous people in the US because they feel like they don't belong to the indigenous people of the America, of 
of the US and they are trying to find their place in the country. Um, so that's something that I, I wrote about in my master thesis, talking about the fact that sometimes how they are dealing with their own identity. Um, so I, I don't, I guess that there might be some conflicts um, between migrants, but uh, I don't have like specific data, so I didn't do any interviews on that um, specific point. And in terms of laws, there is in the US, and you probably uh, know about that, a executive order that's been passed in, um, I do not remember the date, but um, it was about like limited, how to offer limited services to, um, not how to um, give services to people, migrants who have limited capacities in English. Um, I think it's called the Order 1316. I just remember the number, not the date. It's weird. Um, but in this order, the uh, federal agencies, they have to provide services to people um, who don't have like um, a good quality of English. So the um, tool that I talk about, the I speak, the Je parle tools, it was part of this executive order. So people, um, so like DHS or CBP, they have to provide some tools to be able to communicate with um, migrants. Um, but those tools, as I said, they are not always um, the best tools. They don't really understand maybe how they're um, like living their, with their own languages. Um, as I said, um, some indigenous migrants, they don't, Unnecessarily write or like can understand like the, their language like in the tool, so there are still a lot of barriers for them. So and to answer your question, the thing I wanted to say is that there's not a lot of laws, but there's a lot of um, humanitarian groups who are helping, and there's not a lot of data about um, indigenous migrants in the U.S. because. The U.S. don't necessarily recognize that they are indigenous because they're not coming from the U.S. So it's really rely on humanitarian group to be able to talk with them, to do interviews, um, and I think that's how like most of the interpreter services are given because they are people living in the U.S. who speak uh, MAM, for example, and they are um, giving some services at the border. I know there are some groups of people who are trying to stay in like borderlands and like trying to be there to help with translation, um, but nothing that comes necessarily from, from the state. <laughs> so three questions and, and remarks. Uh, um, the first one is for, it's for Lola. Um, I was uh, curious about the conception of a uh, search and rescue that could be developed by Frontex, knowing anything that is happening with all the scandals of pushbacks that are ongoing. What are their conception of um, a search and rescue? Uh, the second remark is more for uh, Terence Garrett. It's, um, I'm very impressed, uh, so I'm not from the borderland, of course, of the US-Mexico border, but see from afar, I'm impressed by the creativity of your governors, either in Arizona or in Texas, to create any kind of fencing. In Yuma, it was all those containers this summer, right? And then you mentioned this uh, steel wall that I even, didn't even see in my... Um, uh, press review. Anyway, so I just want to know what could be the influence of such bricolage in French of walls on g more greater strategies to build up elaborative type of walls. So maybe there is a link with the presentation yesterday about the engineering, uh, the military engineering, like because it seems that the in, in the history of the border militarization of the U.S.-Mexico border, you had this moment of renovation, bricolage, that gets systematized. You can see also that in Israel-Palestine, because the beginning of the first world was indeed a bricolage. It was so small elements that were further integrated into uh, strategies. So it's not really a question, but I want to know more, maybe, how do you link this bricolage element to something uh, bigger? And the last thing is for Talia, it's more, um, I, I will do a bit of promotion for where I teach in Paris, which is Inalco, which is a school of oriental uh, language, our students learn that, and two colleagues last year, two anthropologists, Marie-Caroline Saglio Yatmirsky and um, Alexandra Galitsin Lumpe, published a book called Lingua Non Grata, where they studied all this, the, the problem with languages in situation of migration from a departure moment till the arrival into a new country. And it's a big issue now in France, especially the translation 
in courts when migrants are arriving that is um, uh, used by a private company, ESM, that is under a lot of scrutiny and a lot of scandal also. And at Inalco, these two colleagues, um, they created a specific formation, specific training, one-year training for refugees and for foreigners that are living in France to be able to mediate with their language situation of migration and to deal with these differences of... Uh, so it's, it's just a bit of promotion from, from my school and the book is actually very related to what you were describing here. Voilà. Ah, it's in open access. <laughs> voilà. Yeah, for open access. Um, so it's really fun to answer questions about Frontex. Thank you for that question, because it doesn't matter how critical you are, it seems you never exaggerate. So it's a lot of fun. Um, so the quick answer to your question is Frontex does not have a search and rescue mandate. They do not, it's not part of their job. Uh, wherever they're present along the southern border, so think Spanish, uh, Spain, Italy, Greece, uh, they do not do rescues, they do surveillance, they do control, but they do not do rescues. Um, now, we know Frontex is a, a monster with uh, insatiable hunger, uh, so will they get there? Will they eventually be present in the English Channel? The answer is probably yes. Uh, will they eventually want to be involved in search and rescues? We don't know, but my guess is that if there's money involved, the answer will probably be yes, too. Thanks for your question. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Simino, for your question or your comment, if I may. Uh, this is campaign season, uh, and so Abbott's creating a political spectacle. You'll see that from other southern, uh, southern governors on the border as well, like the Arizona governor particularly, uh, and even the Florida governor, who's nowhere near the U.S.-Mexico border, but is getting involved in terms of uh, flying refugees to Martha's Vineyard. It's, it's all a spectacle is what it is. Uh, and uh, what happens is, is that Abbott's in a kind of a fight for his re-election life and he wants to also, he's thinking about being president of the United States. So the, the more uh, theatrics, the more spectacle that he can uh, throw out there, essentially. And that's the whole reason. What happens is, every time there's a Democratic president, beginning uh, with uh, the previous governor, uh, they, they, they created programs, right, operations, to essentially embarrass the Democratic president, okay? And uh, so it ginned up again once, uh, once uh, you had, uh, it's, it's all designed to embarrass uh, uh, Biden and uh, also, also to fundraise, so that's the commodifying effects of the spectacle. So I, I hope I answered your question. And the bricolage or the, uh, or the steel wall was just, uh, he coordinated with Steve McCraw, uh, who is the director of the Texas Department of Public Safety and the Texas National Guard, which was all part of the uh, Operation Lone Star again, to simply embarrass their political opponents. Uh, there are other aspects of it as well, chain link fences uh, being built on private property, the governor getting involved in arresting people for trespassing <laughs> rather than Im immigration trying to get around federal law, which the state does not have that authority. So it, it, it's an ongoing spectacle that will persist until the, this election cycle is over at least. If I could add just one little tidbit or fun fact for, for trivia for all of you, I don't know how close you were paying attention to the economy back then, um, but when Governor Abbott first started using the shipping containers as walls along the southern border, um, that was right when the economy was reopening and we had backlogs at all the ports and we had a shortage of shipping containers. So rather than put them back into circulation to clear the backlogs at the ports, he was putting them along the river to, to make a show. Hi, thank you all for your presentations. Uh, I have. Two questions, is that okay? We have time? Uh, for the first two presenters, uh, Terence, the, one of the images you shared uh, with the horse and everything, it always reminded, immediately reminded me of the atrocities of slavery. White man on horse, reining in, black man. Um, so how is it covered? Is, it, is the parallel not seen? Because I'm not uh, very aware of the local politics of it. Is it not covered in that way? Is, it, is the parallel not seen? Do we have a problem with seeing the race of it all? 
Uh, and do we have no knowledge of the fact that USA is very complicit in how poor Haiti is and therefore there's all this migration coming in uh, and not feel at all responsible for that uh, because it was in 1800s, so who cares? Um, so that's my question for you. And for the second one, I was wondering if the SAR's change is uh, kind of in line with the externalization of borders in, of Europe uh, to Turkey, to Libya, to Morocco, where we're like, you guys do the human rights violations. So is it kind of like, well, if it happens in the sea, it's not in continental Europe, so who cares about human rights in that area? Uh, is that kind of the mentality that is going on there? So those are my two questions. Thank you. Okay, so under, um, under U.S. law, um, Border Patrol agents are, are, are supposed to at least encounter, if not apprehend, using Title VIII or Title 42 uh, on any migrant um, coming to the United States. Well, the Texas Department of Public Safety was there, and there was an Office of in Inspector General report uh, basically uh, investigating, right, the, so, the, the racism or the, uh, the encounters uh, shown in the pictures, and they, uh, the Inspector General working with the Department of Homeland Security found that, uh, well, uh, he, the, the Border Patrol agent, even though he's supposed to work under federal law, especially the Refugee Act of 1980, and allow people to come to shore, right, after crossing into U.S. territory, because it's the middle of the Rio Bravo, Rio Grande, uh, well, you know, it, it was unfortunate, um, but he, because of Title 42 and an encounter, we're going to go ahead and look past it, right? So, this, so in other words, uh, even the oversight uh, people in, in the Department of Homeland Security were okay with it, okay? So if you, I, I read the Office of Inspector General reports on this incident, and I haven't incorporated that in my, my, my paper, but... Uh, that I'm still working on. But um, yeah, so th they're given a pass simply because of F Title 42, even though, you know, uh, you know, you probably shouldn't do that and you should obey U.S. law, a uh, Border Patrol agent. And, and they were doing it at the behest of uh, 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 the Texas uh, Department of Public Safety was telling the Border Patrol agents, you got to stop them from crossing into Texas and they listen to them, they don't have any authority over it at all. They said, well, that was kind of a mistake. So I hope that answers it. As far as the racial aspects of it, yeah, I mean, it was, it was clearly happening, and they, were, they, they, they used a technique they call twirling or accidentally hitting uh, migrants, and they, and they use that as an excuse to sort of not say, well, they're not really whipping them with the reins when in fact they were. Thanks very much for, uh, for your question which, uh, on externalization of uh, search and rescue, which I'm going to answer in two parts. Uh, the first part is about sovereignty. And I think it's fair to say that search and rescue, uh, the convention and the thinking, is a sort of remnant of a better time, where we divided the world's oceans into sections to make sure that everybody was safe. But as I said, um, the zone of responsibility and territorial waters are not the same which means that domestic legislation does not apply. Immigration law does not apply in the entirety of the zone of responsibility. So that is one part of, it's not classic externalization, but we're trying to apply domestic law in actually a space that is outside the space of sovereignty. Then the second part is the classic form of externalization, right? Um, and here, yes, what Europe and individual, individual member states have been doing is transferring funds, why is it being so annoying? Uh, transferring funds uh, to countries, to neighboring countries, transit countries that cooperate uh, with the European Union, notably uh, uh, Turkey, um, Libya, and Morocco, to develop their capacities or something. Uh, now, we have all heard about what happens in the brutalities that the um, Turkish Coast Guard and the so-called Libyan Coast Guard have committed. Um, in Spain, something else similar is happening, but it's a little bit more insidious uh, because there are a lot of uh, geopolitical conversations that are happening in the background. And what is happening is that both the European Union and Spain are transferring funds. Um, and we have an overlapping, like both uh, areas of sovereignty, of uh, responsibilities overlap. So what's happening right now is that when, whenever there is a migrant boat, um, the 
the Spanish government will send uh, rescue assets to the area, but it will ask them to wait. And as soon as the Marine Royale, the, the Moroccan uh, Navy, is in sight, they are supposed to leave. What happens? We don't know. You know, so is externalization happening? Yes. What are the consequences? Probably what you said. But because it happens over there, we really have no way of knowing uh, what's going on. Thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking all our panelists for their really interesting presentations. <laughs>